Doug Cohey, you were with um, a, uh, a relatively small but very important group of American military personnel that went to Guyana in November 1978 to respond to the uh, the Jonestown tragedy. And what was your what was your particular job in uh, in Guyana? Okay, when uh, once we got on the ground in Guyana, uh, the buddy that I was with, we uh, unloaded our communications jeep, uh, Mark 107, if I remember right, and we had met part of the Panama team that had just gotten there ahead of us. So uh, Chief Huddleston uh, was in charge. So some of the Panama team went up to um, Jonestown. A couple more people went to Matthews Ridge. And then I stayed at uh, Tamari at Georgetown with a guy named Leonard Witten, which at that time he and I set up our communications jeep so that we could do uh, high frequency communications with um, uh, Airways folks, uh, Albrook Airways or the, um, um, I'm trying to think, Puerto Rico, I can't remember their call sign right at the time, but between all of us, we did a flight following with the helicopters, and we did communications back to the United States through uh, connecting through the HF to telephone to keep uh, command notified of uh, what's going on. So it's kind of a communication with aircraft, but it sounds like it's a general sort of communications kind of this particular yeah, this particular operation was more built on communications, whereas uh, though we had uh, were air traffic controllers by trade, most of us, the um, I only did a little bit of helicopter landing zones until all the helicopter people got comfortable just coming and going out of Tamari, and they didn't really need any extra assistance. So then I was just reduced to uh, not reduced, but communication wise but we were we were busy for a long time sure and did the communications that well, I mean what what sort of communications were you were you handling like um, you know I, I don't know if any of this stuff is still secret but we're not getting into that. no there's no there's nothing secret about any of this okay, um, yeah the the uh, passing of number of bodies as they were collected wow. uh, so that people up at Dover could be ready for um, for what they needed to meet each each aircraft. Wow. Um, the Army came in uh, after us, but they had better communications. They had a real cool satellite set up that I'd never seen before. That was the first time I'd seen it. Uh, but, you know, since technology, everybody's got a satellite radio. But yeah. Yeah. the uh, HF net was how we communicated back then for yeah. long distances, but we would communicate they would hook up a modem with the telephone and we would just call whoever we needed to call. Wow. So you mentioned one of the things, one of the you know, bits of information coming through is the number of bodies from Jonestown. And, and one of the, you know, one of the things that's become clear, you watch news reports from the time and just listen to, you know, the folks who are there at the time. I mean, four, even four days after the fact, November 22nd, for example, the numbers are something like 400. There wasn't there. There wasn't knowledge until maybe a five, six days down the down the road, something like that, that you've got bodies stacked on bodies. Did you did you actually sort of see that yourself? Did the did well? Did you just kind of see the numbers accumulating as as time went by. We were keeping track of the numbers ourselves, but I happened to be uh, at the the radio when the call from Jonestown came to us and said that they had found extra 400 plus bodies in a low-lying ditch yeah. and I had to go okay I went into the uh, to the army and the ALSI commander in their tent and they said hey I got some bad news for you there's there's an additional 400 bodies because at that time we were actually starting to gear down and remove everybody but it was like the, the anticipated yeah, was, number had been reached or something? Had, yeah, well, they had already cleaned up all the bodies, but the odor was still so strong up there that they started hunting around to, hey, where's, it, where's this odor coming from? And then they uncovered the ditch from, they had bush kind of limbs and stuff on top of it. So when they undid the, uh, the ditch, as it was explained to me, 
the people had died and been laid in the ditch like uh, you were baling hay. You'd put one across and then they put a sheet down and then they would turn the bodies 90 degrees and put them that way. It's like, I'm a farm boy, so that's how we did yeah. it with the bales of hay. So that's what they did with the bodies, but they put a sheet in between each layer and there obviously were several layers to, to the pile. Wow. Yeah. And so you went and told an officer nearby we need 400 yeah, more body bags? I believe um, Lieutenant Colonel Wells was the airlift control element leader. Yeah. Uh, he happened to be sitting with the Army leader at the time, and I walked in. They were discussing how, okay, how many flights we need to get everybody out. And then I had to interrupt them and say, hey, we still got a whole bunch of bodies, and they had to redo their thinking. Wow. So uh, where did those extra – do you know, I mean, did they – these are – these are grim, grim things to be talking about, but it's part of the story. I mean, yeah. were there 400 additional body bags just in a truck somewhere, or did they have to be brought oh, in? Th or? That, was, oh. that was part of our communication to make sure we called Dover and, and got the uh, appropriate number of equipment that they needed. They were putting smaller children, two and three, in a bag after a while. Right, yeah. And, and so that was yeah. an issue. Uh, the pararescue guys that had come down with their helicopters uh, were, were traveling back and forth with them, and then we, would, we, the Air Force, would put them on a 141 and take them back to Dover. When, when you say that putting two or three children in a body bag was an issue, you just mean in terms of body count, or what do you mean? I'm not that? sure how. they. I guess they determined that it would be better for the body bag itself that if they tried to fill it up with more than just a small baby. I mean, we're talking small children here, a lot. Right, so for lack of a better way of putting it, if I, if I get you that just to make sure we have enough body bags, then let's not use a big body bag for just small body, let's build the thing up. I, did, I, I got that impression, but though yeah. I couldn't really tell you, hopefully no. somebody from the Army Graves Registration people if you ever get a hold of any of them, can yeah. can you give you a better idea of that, sure. of that answer? Yeah. Do you have? I, I'm asking this question just because of something I read yesterday, and, and you may not have have an answer. But I'm just wondering if you do. One of the questions that arose is why weren't the bodies? Why were the bodies flown to Dover? Or why weren't they flown to a base in California? Um, what's the one in Northern California there? I can't. Uh, escapes me right now, but a base relatively close to the the Bay Area, where most of those folks were from. I was just reading something from a family member written, you know, about a decade after the event, and they're asking this question: Where are these bodies flown to Dover on the other side of the continent, when most of these folks were actually from the California Bay Area, and they could have flown them to a base in California? Do you have any sense of that, or is that is that was yeah, that the Dover Air Force Base is the processing center for bodies. Yeah. That's where they go. That's Dover is the processing center. So Dover is the one that gets them. They have the capability of um, uh, of handling the dead people, and virtually everybody comes to Dover. I mean, the Afghanistan people, Iraqi, whoever dies overseas gets processed at Dover. Yeah, yeah. Which I think that that makes that makes perfect sense. I know that there had been. Not not too long before Jonestown, there'd been a plane crash with uh, over 200 casualties that came through Dover, and so at least there were some folks on the ground there with experience. With well, experience. both President Obama and Trump have gone to Dover to right. welcome back yeah. the bodies, as it yeah. were, and see the family. Sure. So yeah. that's, that's not uncommon, place. and that's, yeah. the, that's, the, that's the key lookout. That's just where it's done. That's just where it starts. Yeah. So where, where were you based uh, stateside in November 1978? The Charleston Air Force Base. Charleston Air Force Base. Had you ever heard of People's Temple before November 19th or November 20th, 1978? Had you ever heard of this group before? Sure. I, I'm a news person. I keep up with the news. They had been on the news uh, prior to this. So you knew about it? Oh, oh yeah, I, I yeah. knew about them. Did you know that they had that a lot of them had gone to Guyana? Not really sure how many people. I just 
had known that their people had left. Something. So you you had heard of uh, the People's Temple. You had some sense that some part of People's Temple was in Guyana. Do you remember what that uh, you know what that first uh, step was of getting you down to Guyana? How did that? How did the ball get rolling for you of getting you from your base in the states down to a country you probably had never been to before? The boss called me and he told me to get a hold of Rick Wilson, and then they gave us our marching orders on what to bring down, and we had uh, weapons and communications gear, which is our function when we go into a uh, possible combat environment. That's the whole purpose of combat control is that we're first in and we do communications that is more lightweight. And then if you're doing something more than just going into the woods, then we'll take a Jeep, which is a communications Jeep with us. So yeah. we have a communications Jeep where we can talk on AM, FM, HF, and it's all encrypted capability in case we need to do its encryption. So we got on the airplane and we were the third 141 out of there. The bosses had gone in on number one and two. But by the time we got there, they had already turned around with uh, Congressman Ryan and had left. And just before we landed, the Panama team from, um, uh, why am I drawing a blank on the air base? <laughs> Yikes. The Panama team had got there, and Chief Huddleston was left in charge, and then Chief Huddleston gave us our assignments on what we were what we were going to do. So, do you remember? Was this November nineteenth? Do you remember what day you you got into Guyana? Was it the nineteenth, the twentieth, something the, like that? The very first day, uh, I believe, was the nineteenth. But then, um, Rick Wilson and myself, since we had a jeep. We actually took the ALSI commander into the consulate into Georgetown proper itself. Oh, wow. Which is where, on the way into Georgetown, um, I saw the Banks Beer Brewery, which brought me to, oh, I think I know what kind of souvenir I want on this one. <laughs> but uh, we spent a day and a half at the consulate before we went back out to the airport to get sure. things started for the actual recovery of the bodies. Now, so I, I want to come back to the consulate in a second, but you you indicated that um, the early thinking was that you might be heading into a combat situation. Was that, was, did, was that an, I mean, um, did that hold all the way through landing in Guyana that we might be heading into some sort of combat situation here? Yes, uh, we did not, the, the, the weapons fire at the airport uh, could have been somewhere else. I'm, we're talking Jonestown Airport for the congressman. But the um, the thought might be that we needed weapons. So actually, Rick Wilson and I were on board uh, another medevac 141, and the nurses would come up to us and say, we're really glad that you're on the airplane. I just didn't have the heart to tell them that I can't do anything for you until I get off the plane. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, we had a lot of weapons. We could do just about anything. Really? How, how long were you in Guyana before you realized that there wasn't going to be a, a, a firefight? Of any uh, just shortly after we landed in the, the, okay. the back of the 141 open, Chief Huddleston met us at the back of the plane. He says, oh, we're good on weapons. You, could, you can put everything away. So uh, we put most everything away except for our 38s, which we needed to protect the weapons. Yeah, and we kept them mostly hidden from just driving from the airport into Georgetown. And then you said you you spent over a day at the consulate, the U.S. consulate. Yeah, we spent the night at the consulate. In fact, I slept on the floor of the consulate general's uh, office. What was uh, what was the atmosphere in the consulate like? I, we didn't see very many people there. Uh, we were kind of kept apart from the rest of the crowd. That's, that's kind of reason why they, they put us in the, the consulate uh, general's uh, office. We just, that was a good place to hide us. So we were just there, and we just kind of spent the night. And then uh, most 
of the day, the next day, but not all of it. And then we went back to the airport and that's where we started to set up. You set up operations there. Did you have much interaction with, uh, with Guyanese when you were there? There was a few of the locals, as we'd like to call them, that would uh, come out to the airfield and see that we were there because it was easy enough to, there, were, there wasn't a fence around the airport that I remember. So we were at one end of the runway, and but the trees and uh, open area was such that people could walk up. So yeah, we had some contact with them, not much. But nothing like no conversations with locals about Jonestown or anything like that? No, none whatsoever. Wow. How long were you on the ground in Guyana, in Georgetown? Uh, I think we were there a total of 10 days. 10 days total. So when you think about that 10 days, what are the, what are the memories that stand out the most? in your own mind well i uh, when the when the helicopters first started going back and forth you know when i was not working it's my turn to work the radios i would i'd help try to help the engineers clean out their helicopters but they were kind of protective of their helicopters saying you know no i got it uh and i says okay that's fine um but probably uh, i saw jim jones's body bag you did. So that was kind of a semi-highlight of what we were doing. We were there for him. So we saw his body bag. You saw his body bag. You didn't see the body? Not the body, just the body bag. You know, he, he was tagged separately. Was that, um, just to pause here for a second, was that just coincidental that you happened to see that? Or was that kind of a, hey, come check this out, here it is, kind no, of? No, my, my buddy said, hey, Doug, come on over here and check this out. This is, this is him. And we're going, okay. Wow. See, the, the problem with yeah. some of the news media, as it were, was because we weren't allowed to talk to anybody. Uh, they basically, the Army kept the, uh, any news people away from us for the most part. But I would read a thousand-word article in a newspaper and go, well, there's only one piece of information that's only partially right. Wow. And you go, and that's when you start having a little bit of distrust towards newspaper reporting in particular, going, well, they just made this big old article about nothing. It yeah. really didn't tell anybody anything else. And I'm going, huh, that was kind of an eye opener for me. That was, uh, you know, I always relied on newspapers being pretty accurate in their information, but over the years, you go, huh, oh, they didn't quite get that right. Yeah, so you're reading articles about what's happening in Guyana. Meanwhile, you're experiencing what's happening there, and there's kind of a disconnect. Oh, I, trust me, there's a definite disconnect. Yeah. Can you do any of the, like, just as an example, does any example come to mind of, the, 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 of a disconnect that comes to mind right now? I, I think uh, uh, they were trying to gauge the number of bodies particularly yeah. the body count uh that was always off there was never they never got good timely information on that so they would report um you know since vietnam is all about body count so mm. they kind of latched onto that pretty quick and that was always off it wasn't ever accurate Oh, I see. Because you, yeah. you had the actual numbers coming across your computer. Sure. Yeah, I knew exactly how many were coming and going. So you mentioned that, you know, the memory of seeing Jim Jones's body bag, the, the memory of hearing the, the body count uh, come through and the communications needing to tell your officer that we need, you know, 400 more body bags. What are, are there other memories that, you know, really stand out um, when you – Think about those 10 days in Guyana? Well, having been the recipient of the, all the bodies coming down from Jonestown, yeah. um, you, you kind of felt, you know, bad for the graves registration folks, people that were doing all the work, because that's a sideline job for the Army people. I mean, they have other jobs, but they also do this. They've been trained to do this picking up the bodies thing. Mm. So. I happened to 
call Puerto Rico, uh, Rosie Rhodes. Oh, thank you, Rosie Rhodes. And I said, hey, I could use a bag of ice. And they says, okay, we'll get you some ice. So about 24 hours later, this friend of mine that was driving a forklift says, hey, Doug, I got your ice. I says, okay, and I started to climb into the cab of the truck. He says, no, no, it's right there on the front. And I looked, and there was this case that somebody told me was a torpedo case hmm. full of water, frozen. <laughs> I had a 400-pound ice cube. <laughs> and so I says, okay, don't tell anybody. And I have them put it right next to the Jeep. So I didn't, I was afraid of like a run on the ice going on before we could figure out what to do with a 400 pound block of ice. Yeah. And then uh, a couple guys said, Hey, I got some sodas. Can I put it in the tube? I said, Oh yeah, that's a good idea. And then a little while later I said to some other guys, we got to figure out something to do. Let's do something for the graves registration people. Mm -hmm. So we went into the army guys and said, Hey, I've got a 400 pound block of ice. Let's throw a party for the graves registration people when they get back. Mm. That's what we did with the ice. We we just kept everything cold like a refrigerator. Yeah. And and when they got the graves registration folks, they had to burn all their clothes and big fire truck hosed them off. And but they had beer and sodas and odds and ends that we probably weren't supposed to have. But okay. Did. So the ice was related to the, the heat and the humidity that I've heard about down there. Oh, God. Well, it never rained the whole time we were there, but it was hot and muggy. Yeah. And so there's a, there's one, there's a fellow named Jeff Briley who unfortunately has passed away, but he wrote a memoir. Um, he, was from, he was with the crew from Panama, and he came in, and he wrote about this. He said when they came back from Jonestown, there was a big party. He says what you guys said that the guys, well, I don't know if parties are the right word. These guys had, to, these folks had to burn their clothes because of the, the stench. Um, and then, uh, you know, and I guess it was just kind of a, a way to just, what, to relieve the pressure or decompress, right? After several days in this intense heat and humidity dealing with this horrific situation in Jonestown. They deserve all the credit they can possibly get. Yeah, because we're talking about bodies that have been there, what, three, four days in this. Yeah, that's just at the start. Yeah. And then there were stored more bodies as the operation went through that were there almost a week. Yeah. And I imagine that, I mean, I'm sure you you experienced some of that as well, right? Just the, the powerful smell and everything oh, yeah. along with that. I, 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 have to, I have to say to anybody that if you ever get the unfortunate opportunity to smell a dead rotten body you will never forget the odor mm. ever yeah yeah um how did you guys you guys are in georgetown um you know i guess i'm just interested in just the way folks deal with these situations um the memoirist wrote about, you know, um, when the Gray's registration folks and the others are at work in Jonestown, um, you know, uh, just very stoic and very businesslike. And, you know, uh, but then there would be moments of, you know, dark humor and things like that. And then he mentions a party where folks just kind of blow off steam and, and decompress. In, in your own case, you know, what was your own method of, of just kind of processing what was going on you know i didn't have that much difficult with the with the issue there because being detached from the actual bodies themselves but just still helping out i mean body bags still leaked they smelled the they needed to clean out the helicopters and, and so uh, it wasn't a perfect situation but it wasn't it was it was more of a learning situation for me. I'm still a young man. I was I was 25 at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. 25. Yeah, it's 25, and yeah. so uh, that was just a learning environment for me, and and just one of those um, life situations that you come across. I since I didn't have to do the other stuff, it didn't affect me. 
It's a little, much, a little more, I mean, not quite abstract, because as you say, you've got the right. lean body bags and all that, but it is, it's, it's certainly not as direct as what the folks correct. in Correct. Uh, with the little distance, it was okay with, you know, I didn't have any real mental issues about it. Yeah. What was your perception of the people in the body bags? Um, did you just assume at the time that, I, well, what, what, if anything, what, if anything, did you assume about these 900 Americans who you guys were now in the process of cleaning out of Guyana? That, I mean, that topic must have come up. Like, and what is this all about? It was really in the newspapers that kind of filled us in on the background of what Jonestown had happened to it in regards yeah. to Jim Jones um, starting that. And, and basically, you just come down to why do people think like that or want to be in that situation? What is it that's, that made them want to get into that situation? And you just kind of think about it and you can't come up with an answer why people think the way they think. Mm. So you just go, it just is and move on. Yeah. 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 It's hard to, I mean, it's hard to imagine many people went to Guyana, you know, assuming that it would end, end the way it did. It's just, it's, it's nuts how that, how that worked out. Well, there's just a lot of my friends that want to retire from the FAA and they go, hey, I'm going to Montana. They just want to get away from everything mm. and be in a more open area. And maybe people down there, I'll never know, but a bunch of them. Oh, I think there's something to that. I think there was kind of the let's escape to paradise kind of thing, you know. Do you, do you find yourself, is, is the topic of, of Jonestown, People's Temple, is that a topic of enduring interest to you given your oh, involvement yeah. in your response to it? All right. Several months ago, at least it seems like several months ago, it could have been longer, the uh, State Department finally released the documents of what had uh, their investigation of how the State Department handled the situation itself down in Jonestown. And so I read through all those documents uh, of what was happening behind this, or the before the scenes, as it were, mm. uh, on the State Department. Those documents were rather revealing. Uh, so I'm going, so there were definitely some uh, uh, mistakes made by the State Department uh, personnel and you know consequently you got a bunch of Americans died certainly there'd been a lot of warnings you know defectors from the group had 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 said you know that's a pretty dangerous situation down there but you know and I know there are questions about the embassy the US embassy I, the reason I asked you the question about the atmosphere at the consulate is you know I was wondering if there's a sense of panic or something like you know we we dropped the ball, you know, or should have known or something like that. But. Well, through the documents, you would certainly think that that happened. But again, yeah. uh, Rick and I were isolated for the most part uh, away from everybody. Yeah. So, so you, you didn't see that. You didn't no. See that. Yeah. Have you, as the years have gone by and documentaries have come out, have you had an interest in seeing them? Or, you know, if you saw a new biography of Jim Jones, would you be particularly drawn to it? Or is it, is it kind of a topic? It sounds like you're kind of interested in it. At least you want to know what the government reaction Yeah, I, I, I watch all that and read all of it because you're there and you go, but when you only have one portion, you don't know, you don't know the whole story. Yeah. There's only so many people that get to know the whole story behind everything. So, uh, I mean, I've even gone to Google Earth and gone to Jonestown to see what Google Earth has to show you. Wow. of where Jonestown proper used to be. And yeah. then you see the, the old strip and then where if you look at the maps of how Jonestown was built, where everything was, and now all you see is basic brush. It's basic jungle. Yeah. Yeah. Well that's why I'm I'm I appreciate the your willingness to uh to share your your stories. Cause um you know each participant has his or her own view but you can put them all together and, and get something comprehensive. And this is a, this is a topic, uh, there's no book on this topic on the military response to Jonestown. So other than this published memoir, um, but um, so it's a topic that I, I just think, uh, you know, we need to make sure it doesn't get 
doesn't get lost and as many folks as participated even in even in indirect ways that may seem inconsequential all of that's important pull it all together and you have a comprehensive story I think the, for me one of the tragic things is John, Jim Jones is telling the people that we have to all take ourselves out and you know take out take the babies with us etc because the US government is basically going to declare war on us but the tragedy of course is the US government well, I mean, you indicated the State Department kind of, you know, probably dropped the ball, you know, before them beforehand. But you indicated, you know, when you guys went down, you thought you might be heading into a combat situation. And I'm assuming part of that had to do with not only fighting whoever might want to fight, but with rescuing people. What Was that, do you remember if that was part of it as well, that not only might there be people to fight, but there are probably some people to rescue as well. Was that part of your thinking? We first thought that possibly weapons fire on the airplane, so we would have to get off to try to protect the airplane. Yeah. And after that, it would be just a fluid situation this for whatever we encountered. Yeah, just to see what's going on. Yeah. Well, I, I do, uh, Doug Hohe, I do appreciate your, uh, you know, taking the time to to share your stories with us. If you happen to know other other vets who participated in any way. You know, we'd we'd love to hear from them too. So, if you, you know, much. if you've known Christopher Knight, he's got a list of people that I gave him. Yeah, and so I'm hoping to hoping to to get all that information and make all the contacts we can. Sounds good. Great. Well, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks very much. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thanks.